I've analyzed hundreds of games played by Karokan beginners to realize that only one simple concept may keep you away from success. To keep it brief, you're making way too many moves onto this side of the board. Here's the explanation. At first, we learn that checkmate ends the game, so because you're a good student, you're probably following basic opening principles, get your king to safety, and naturally, you start looking for ways to attack the enemy king. Generally, this sounds about right, but not when it comes to this opening. Simply because of the way Karokan is designed, in most of the variations, you are supposed to attack onto the opposite side of the board, highlighted by the green rectangle. So, in a nutshell, this advice alone will completely change your results, but in case you're wondering what the heck am I talking about, I'm gonna be walking you through three model games that I have played against intermediate players, showcasing exactly how you are supposed to attack white by using the green side of the board. Gonna be going for uh, your favorite car Khan and okay, opponent plays knight f3. Knight f3 usually uh, will lead to the exchange variation, which is actually what we get on the board via transposition. And uh, already I'm gonna save yourself the pain from starting with bishop to g4. That is a very common mistake, simply because uh, you're kind of showing your end a little bit too early. Okay, bishop to g4, the very first second uh, you can play it. That's gonna give your opponent opportunity to play h3, and then you're in a little bit of a shady spot. Because uh, if you retreat, uh, whoops, if you retreat, uh, as I was about to say, he has g4, and after bishop back, he has knight e5, and after knight e6, he has bishop b5, and then f4, f5 is crashing, just devastating. And on the other hand, if your plan is to take the knight, well, uh, congratulations, you have just uh, prematurely uh, given up the bishop here. Probably that's why uh, your heart stuck 1000. So, I'm gonna start with the knight, and uh, this is just gonna be a little bit better because, uh, kinda, no matter what he does next, we can play bishop g4. Oh no, that is my biggest knight when he has just played h3. I'm never gonna get uh, bishop g4 in this life. Sh should we just resign? How are you? Is there actually life? Can you play this game if you are not able to get that pin? I feel like this is just everybody that is watching this video biggest nightmare. Okay, see, you genius. This is why we start with the bishop. I feel like this is the voice of the audience. That's why you should have gone bishop immediately, you little bat, sir. Because now they have this, and white is winning or what? Well, let me clarify that a little bit. So. The theory goes, ideally you want to play bishop to g4 versus advance. I totally meant to say exchange. I'm stupid, okay? Don't follow me. So, when you don't have bishop to g4, bishop to f5 uh, will work just fine, and I'm about to show you why. You see bishop to b5. Okay? Bishop is spinning. I'm gonna play e6. I could also play the move... Uh, Knight f6. Both are totally uh, reasonable. I think uh, really it doesn't really matter which one uh, you choose. We just have to wait uh, and kind of be mindful of the threat that he could potentially go knight e5, sort of uh, increasing the pressure uh, on the on the pin. And I'm gonna play knight f6. So normally you develop knights on natural squares, bishop g4 or f5, and then this bishop always goes on e7, below 1500. d6 is a little bit uh, more active, a little bit better in general, but uh, since you're gonna get to deal with a lot of guys playing uh, their bishops, you know, just like kind of this, it will be a little bit annoying and uh, I think just a nice uh, tip precisely for games below 1500, always go bishop e7, that works like a charm. Okay, we have knight e5, so this is interesting because uh, we get to discuss about how should you uh, deal with uh, this kind of threat. It's pretty funny, by the way. Typical mistake by opponent, pushing these pawns on the side like this, and bishop on b5 is about to do the other bishop. This is pretty much, uh, this game is just a bouquet of typical mistakes, I feel like. Would be even funny if we lose it, so. Knight e5. You can defend with rook c8. You can also defend with queen b6. These are pretty much the two moves that uh, come to mind. Queen to b6 is interesting because it's targeting the bishop as well. So I'm gonna do that just because it's gaining a tempo. In general, when you can gain a tempo, that makes it a good move. 
Rook C8 was just kind of uh, solid, but a little bit more passive, I think we can uh, we can call it that way. Now, opponent has uh, many moves. Uh, yeah, he can take with a knight, he can take with a bishop, uh, he can play C4, defend the bishop. Uh, chooses to take this way, I can take uh, bishop or knight. Uh, if I take bishop, he takes this, so I don't think moving our king is really a good idea uh, in the middle game. So, we want to take this way, just so we keep option to castle short next. Bishop has to move. If bishop d3, we're kind of like okay with the trade. Probably you could even go greedy and pick up the pawn there, but um, no need to do that. I'll just keep it simple and trade. Uh, if bishop a4, I would have castled. Now, I don't want to give him, uh, I don't want to allow him to double up the pawns, so bishop g6 alternative, but a bit passive because you give him the turn. So if you trade, you sort of keep the uh, initiative. It's still your turn, so you get to make another move, uh, saving a tempo this way. Hopefully that's clear enough. And next up, we're ready to play c5. Okay, big move. It would be hilarious if he played b4. Like trying to stop my idea, but b4 wouldn't have really been a problem because yes, on one hand it is kind of stopping c5, but on the other hand it allows another very important pawn break for the structure. a5. c3 fails to uh, hold his queen side together because after a, b, c, b, have bishop takes simply taking advantage of uh, the pin along the uh, yeah along the a file not even queen b3 there helps him because i can play funny move bishop back on c5 everything is hanging but i'm attacking his queen so he has to exchange and then take back with the bishop and i keep all the pieces and i think we're just a happy camper anyways none of that happened so he just plays c3 <laughs> where i'm gonna go c5 and we are getting a very typical transformation for the exchange variation where we have something that took on c6 we took with a b pawn and then we break with c5 so for many variations this is very typical and black is just slightly better uh, simply due to the fact we're gonna have uh, more pawns in the center i expect him to take i'm gonna take this way and we have two pawns in the center he has no pawns in the center so um that is just uh, slightly better for black because we have better control over the center uh, and we can just, uh, yeah, restrict his pieces pretty much uh, with that. And later on push our pawns. But that's a different story. If he does not take, I could play c4. Fixing a weak pawn on b2. Or I could take on d4, creating an isolated pawn that I can perhaps uh, um, use it as a target and start attacking it. I've got uh, two tempting options. Now opponent uh, taking his time a little bit. Or he may have just fallen asleep because we spent kind of like a minute each move. But uh, hey, uh, we are educating a generation here with a YouTube video. So pardon me, opponent. We had to do that. Okay, opponent doubles down on the idea and plays B4. Huh. Interesting. Notice how C4 would be pointless because there is no longer a, a pawn on B2 to fix. So pretty much uh, only move is this. Do not take, because that gives him uh, open rook. So gotta take, gotta force the uh, Isolani. Queen d4, I'm gonna trade queens, happy with the end game. Uh, probably it's gonna be cd. And okay, got the hook, considering a5, but then b5 is probably what he wants. Could also play uh, rook c8. But just because this rook could be useful for a5, I think it's even clever to use the other rook, just keeping an idea to infiltrate onto the outpost, while simultaneously keeping a5 in the reserve, trying to undermine uh, the queen side. So, what pretty much you're witnessing right now, it is a textbook Karo Khan play on how to win on the queen side. Okay, you can generally just apply that in most of your games and notice how uh, we're pretty much focusing in this rectangle. Okay, knight to c3. I'm gonna do just that and uh, activate, creating a tempo, and he has to play bishop to e3. And there he goes. Now, he may be trying to do something like this. So I'm gonna start with a5, and just kind of um, trying to get rid of that idea immediately, because uh, I was thinking uh, knight e4 will probably blunder. I'm gonna queen, queen v5, and this is a blunder. You post the video, you find why this is a blunder. 
I'm gonna give you time. I'm gonna time down to a second. And then I'm gonna play the brilliant move. Boom. Okay, whoops. What is the defender of the queen? He just disappeared. Have you seen that? It's magic. This is just magic that you're seeing. And how he takes a pawn and just had complete meltdown. Hanging his damn queen. How did this happen? Well, just a move ago, if he was taking, I was able to save and I have an extra piece. Black would have been completely winning. Now he's still gonna play uh, on for like a little bit just because I don't have a lot of time on the clock. But since we are playing uh, with uh, five seconds increment, I'm just gonna be able to make five uh, quick random moves and uh, I'm gonna pretty much have uh, all the time in the world on my clock. So that should not be an issue. This is why I recommend increment uh, if you're trying to play blitz. To be honest, for uh, most of my students, I recommend uh, 10 minutes rapid, no increment, just because 10 minutes is plenty of time already. But if you're really addicted to blitz, then throw in the increment and forget about uh, playing on time. So, okay, rook there. I just mentioned I'm going to make five random moves. I immediately started uh, tanking. Not a good sign, but okay, just attacking his pawn. I'm gonna take it. Uh, should be really easily winnable position. Easily winnable position. Okay, when I'm in time scramble, I forget the English language. Some of you uh, may argue that I never knew the English language in the first place. Uh, well, you're actually kind of right. So I'm just gonna go back with the bishop. I'm gonna do this, I just need to make sure I'm not getting uh, back ranked and I'm probably gonna have to sacrifice my bishop which was intentional. Totally intentional. Just cause I have a queen for a rook so need to not get back ranked. I have one student that uh, <laughs> keeps getting uh, back ranked. Some people have uh, guilty pleasures, we cannot uh, judge. Anybody for that? Uh, now to save you the pain, I'll just fast forward the next couple of moves because the position is completely winning. Just this and uh, simple plan, I already told you. Okay, I'm gonna pull up the wooden spoon for my opponent. He is definitely very deserving for this. He really deserves the wooden spoon for trying to fight uh, on in this uh, position, almost down to queens. <laughs> so I'm having it here ready as a reward for my opponent. You know what? I'm going to bring the other wooden spoon that I have. Just because, uh, well, maybe thinking I'm pretty weird for keeping two wooden spoons on my, uh, on my desk. Well, this is the new one that I got. I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera, but this is a wooden spoon from uh, Hungary. I actually uh, bought it for you guys. Um, I bought it in my trip when I went to meet uh, Badur Jobava, the inventor of Jobava London. And uh, we did an uh, in-person interview for the upcoming Jobava course. So here you have it. Wooden Spoon, Budapest Edition. <laughs> Just for my opponent for playing on uh, Down to Queens. He plays there, not an issue. <laughs> I'm just going to trade. I'm going to give him one queen. I'm going to take the rook, so... Not a problem. To one opponent, you got only one bishop left. And here we go. One in the resigns. Now, thinking how this game was played, what do you guys think uh, our accuracy level should be? I'm going to give ourselves, you know what? I'm going to give like an 88. And I'm going to give my opponent in the meantime, 75. Let's find out. Actually not bad, opponent played like an 81 and I get like a 91 with a brilliant move that I guess was not brilliant. Okay, this wasn't brilliant at all, it was just like a very basic tactic. So, to kind of sum things up here, I uh, felt like if 94, 95 happens, white is getting kind of like a good uh, grip over the queen side, so rook c4. Immediately threatening this, so knight a4 not possible. Had to defend, and now a5, with the idea that I'm threatening to do this, and if b5, knight a4 is never a move, so I have everything under control. I have target, 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 pretty much everything as a target. Um, and uh, yeah, 
play knight a4, queen b5, and okay, he had to play knight b2, which was like kind of like a very uh, unexpected move that I didn't even see. Like this knight retreating move are uh, not easy to find. Also defending the queen, which is the surprising part where I think I don't have anything better apparently than uh, doing this, this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then hit and take, and then I can take. And apparently I am up a clean pawn, but this is equal. Don't ask me how. <laughs> I mean, I would just uh, expect that any day of the week. Black is much better, but I guess we just don't have a way to untangle our pieces with this kind of coming, and I just have to stay passive. Yeah, I don't think this is very relevant. In a nutshell, this was a good move. I mean, you can see the evil is just sometimes chess.com coach is dumb. <laughs> Queen b5 question move, uh, question mark, but... Uh, I think this was good because it really debated uh, this knight c5 idea where by magic, rook c5, this, if you trade, I'm got the extra knight, I got the uh, completely winning position. He hanged his queen and uh, the rest was pretty simple. I think it was actually very good that uh, we played this sort of a uh, nice defensive move with the idea to sacrifice the bishop. That's the only danger in the position. Get rid of that and then, um, yeah, make a luft. Rest is easy. So, um, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, managed to get uh, another black game. Gonna be going for the Karo Khan and uh, let's see what opponent has uh, ready for us. We do get the exchange variation, which is, in my opinion, the most important thing that you need to master, uh, especially if you're like below 1500, just because you're gonna be getting this from so many different move orders. To kind of give you an example, uh, you may have uh, faced moves such as the hillbilly attack in this rating range or any kind of random knight out onto the second move, followed by uh, eventually taking. All of that is basically transposed. So the exchange variation is just that, uh, Normally, you're gonna get a somewhat uh, improved version uh, because those moves uh, like developing knights early or developing the bishop are not particularly helpful. Such as bishop to b5 check, that is not the uh, optimal way of handling this. Quick pause to shout out today's sponsor, which is me. I'm making this video possible, so in case you'd like to share your support, my Karo Khan course is now on a sale. Now, let's get back into the video. The main move, uh, according to the theory, is bishop d3 and then c3 pretty much just trying to transpose into a London system after bishop f4. Yes, that is the idea. But against the check, we have two options. In my opinion, easiest is to trade bishops. Knight c6 is not a mistake, but I'm gonna stick with the easiest move. Always on the check, block with a bishop, offer the trade. Um, yeah, as long as you trade the light squared bishops, uh, this is pretty much... Um, Gonna guarantee that uh, you're not getting mated. Uh, okay, this may sound a little bit obscure. How are you getting mated with the light square bishops? Well, if the bishop is uh, placed there and he has pawn like this, if you castle short, sure, that is gonna be pretty much the main attacker. So, exchanging bishops overall is just gonna give you a very safe game. And I'm actually super glad that we get to deal with queen d3 because this is a move that gets played a lot. And a lot of people are just losing to this for no reason. Because after take, this is the move that uh, I see most people play. The problem is that you are not uh, aware of the queen d7 idea. Simply because you may be forgetting about the b7 pawn. Or you panic. So you play either a knight move and then you lose the pawn for no reason. No. I want you to just play uh, queen to d7 and get comfortable with the end games. So... Hopefully he's gonna trade queens and uh, we're gonna show uh, how to play this in game. He starts with a move knight c3. And this is actually a bit of a tricky position. Because if I play a6, he can trade queens and then my pawn is gonna be hanging. So I don't want that. So in order to deal with this, I could start by uh, developing the knight. Or I could play pawn to e6, having this protected. It's pretty much just creating a threat to take with his last move. And taking, I don't like it because it's threatening to fork me. 
Actually, you know what? I'm gonna take. And I'm gonna show you why. The king is very useful in the center of the board once you get rid of the queens. So stopping his idea of uh, fork and if knight f3, threatening this, I'm just gonna be in time with knight c6. So notice, huge threat. I'm gonna play this. So if you play inaccurate move, thinking a6, get rid of his knight, that is good, but you miss knight e5. So really important, if you don't play this, you're in trouble. This, not too shabby. But just 96 simple move and developing your pieces too. And okay, really uh, get uh, yourself comfortable because uh, we are about to play a uh, school game. Okay, this is really one of the most uh, important structures that you need to um, be comfortable with as a Karakam player. So a6, getting rid of the annoying knight is going to be going to c3 where the knight is kind of misplaced. Uh, because he is supposed to have pawns like that defending each other. The knight on c3 is really not onto like the optimal square. In fact, for this structure, if my opponent could teleport his knight somewhere, he would love to have pawns like this and uh, the knight to be placed on d3, controlling e5 and controlling c5. But notice that it's actually not so easy to get a knight to d3. Like he would need to make all these maneuvers uh, in order to be comfortable. So now I can play knight f6 or I can play the move e6. If I do a little bit of calculation, I notice that knight f6, knight e5 is a little bit annoying. Since if I take it, which I'm kind of forced to, because he's attacking f7 and checking me, he's going to take back with a pawn, targeting my knight, knight has to move, meaning pawn on d5 remains undefended. So by elimination, I have to play this move, not a choice. Then... I could consider uh, knight f6, but because I noticed that the only kind of annoying threat that my opponent has is knight e5, I could actually seriously consider to play a move such as pawn to f6, getting rid of his only active idea. Depends. We're gonna have to wait to see what he plays. Bishop f4 or bishop g5 or bishop e3. These are the moves that I'm expecting him to play. Or he could very well play pawn to a3, why not? <laughs> okay, pawn to a3. I guess my opponent was just kind of uh, a little bit afraid of perhaps a knight landing on b4. Notice that uh, knight b4 is risky since it allows knight e5 and we can no longer take it. Uh, he was just afraid of me taking his pawn. Fine. We'll give him that. Now, we have a choice. We can develop the bishop, we can develop the knight. I think bishop d6 is nice, just kind of taking control over e5. But normally, you hear me say, always play bishop e7 in the exchange. So, I could start this way, I could play bishop e7 after. Um, to be honest, in order to get uh, the most juice out of this, I feel like f6 is uh, very clever. Just to kind of um, really restrict the knight, really restrict his bishop, because whenever the bishop goes there, uh, we can sort of take advantage of it uh, by pushing our pawns and yeah that is just a very useful move to have here uh, it is not really a matter of uh, really threatening to do something ourselves but it's a matter of restricting our opponent's pieces like notice that both of his knights really have a hard time getting any activity they are like greatly restricted by our pawns and Notice how I can already start the move g5. And black is winning. Well, wait a second, how is black winning? Well, my opponent has just uh, failed for a simple trick. I can play g4. Knight has to move, then I'm winning the pawn. Do I want to win with a cheap trick like that? Hell no. I'm just going to go for the positional grind. I feel like this is going to be even more instructive for the sake of the video. I'm gonna go h5, threatening to win the bishop. Now, he has a choice. He plays h4, attacking the pawn, forcing my hand to play g4. So, this comes in an even better version because my pawn on g4 is defended and I can simply take the free pawn on d4. Taking the free pawn on d4 is viable. But I want to show you something even nicer. I just feel like you may be underestimating the strength of black's position. Uh, while, uh, yeah, I think it's very instructive to show you how to restrict his pieces. 
I know this perhaps only problem um, that could happen here is sometimes maybe this, but uh, even if that's a thing, I can move the rook, I guess. But I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to have to worry about it. So I'm just gonna play b5. Completely restricting his knight. So he's defending. Good on him. I'm just gonna bring my knight to f5. I'm ready to mid knight c5 check always with bishop takes. Uh, yeah. Notice that we have it. And now my knight is gonna land on f5. So I did not take the free pawn just to keep the game still uh, somewhat interesting and uh, show even more instructive ideas. So notice that this is having a great pressure on the bishop. The bishop cannot move because the pawn would be hanging. And I don't want to push these pawns because then this would be hanging. So knight is great blockading piece, but I can even activate and perhaps use my king uh, as uh, yeah an attacker. Knight is uh, threatening the pawn. He probably has to defend. I'm going to go uh, king to c6 activating and notice that all of a sudden Perhaps could be interesting to play e5, just because, uh, well, my king defends the pawn on d5 that was hanging a few moves ago. So, next up, I could uh, play even more prophylactic, like rook d8 move to defend, but he goes knight e2. Now, knight e2 doesn't really have a huge threat, maybe he wants to do something like c3. And I think it can really become an interesting game to show what a good knight against a bad bishop can do. So bishop is completely restricted by my pawns. And I'm going to play d4, just kind of highlighting uh, the idea that I'm placing my pawns on lights, uh, on dark squares, completely uh, killing his bishop. He cannot even play f3 because that hangs the bishop. Expecting him to do c3 where uh, I think I'm going to take. And I'm going to bring my rook. Okay, c4, I can take, but I can also go en passant. Taking this way is a thing, but I just want to go for this move because I feel like I could use a5 to activate the second rook. So one rook activates like this via d file and the other rook activates like this via a file. So just imagine uh, we play rook d1 check, we penetrate with both rooks, that is going to be a mating net. I don't think he has much to stop it. And all of this is happening because the bishop is completely locked out of the game. Just notice how uh, effective is the knight putting pressure while the bishop is not doing anything, while the knight still has opportunity to activate. So, very important difference uh, right there uh, between the pieces. Like, yes, generally bishops are slightly better than knights, but not when the bishop is like fully restricted like that. So, uh, you gotta pay attention to the details. And uh, Okay, he plays f4. F4 a good move that I perhaps uh, underestimated. I'm gonna go en passant. And after rook f3, perhaps I made a mistake. I forgot about this idea. Indeed, I forgot about uh, rook f6 uh, intermediate move. Yeah, now not very clear. I'm gonna have to use my king uh, and uh, improve its position. King has to go, um, come now to e6, and uh, it did become a little bit tricky, I have to say. He found a great move, f4 there, credits to my opponent, but uh, I think we should uh, still have it mildly under control. He wants uh, rook d6 check. Not much I can do to stop that. I'm going to play e4, and I'm going to try to just uh, push my pawns, it's like two pawns should be stronger than a uh, pawn alone. So I'm gonna do f5, he has to play g3, but then, yeah, I think I can try to activate. Perhaps I'm in time with a5 now, because uh, I noticed he has this idea to play rook b6 and target my pawn, but I'm gonna start checking him, so I was thinking that this should uh, get him in trouble. Give him a check, and king e3, rook g2, picks up the pawn. So I feel like he has to go passive. And when he goes passive, yeah, I can go e3. Yeah, e3 and if king f1, I have king e4. And rook b5, I think, is a losing move. Now, threatening this with mate, or pawn promotes. And I think uh, we managed to trick him. Pause the video. Find the only winning move. Very typical for rook games. When you're having, you having a pawn like this. Because typical mistake, e2, he has king f2. Your pawn is stuck. But first, you want to check. 
and he doesn't have a good move, has to play there. And now the pawn is pretty much unstoppable. So he checks me, but that does completely nothing. Has to play c7, but I think uh, I can even ignore. I can promote with a mate incoming. So takes is fine, but I can even uh, let him promote because I'm gonna have the uh, initiative. So in such positions where both sides queen, okay, this is like a typical scenario for uh, end games. It doesn't really matter that material is even. It is way more important who has the initiative because I can just use the initiative and uh, checkmate him. Okay, he promotes to a knight just kind of like uh, as a joke to give me a check and then probably resign. But uh, yeah, I can just move. Okay, <laughs> can literally go anywhere. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna be able to escape uh, checks soon after king e6. Uh, it's just like a matter of a uh, few moves. Uh, this is of course uh, not like a serious attempt to stay in the game. Although I have to say I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't see how I'm escaping checks till the end, but I know this is just not gonna work. Um, you know, simply it's not how chess works. So I think King D5 now there and uh, King D4 and he no longer has any checks, but kudos to my opponent. It was a bit of a funny move, probably to a knight and then uh, trying to stay alive. This is gonna happen pretty much next and uh, it's not much you can do about it. So Queen to F1, only move. Literally, uh, yeah, sealing the deal because then uh, we can just genuinely checkmate him on h1. So, opponent resigns. Quite a messy game. Now, to kind of sum it up uh, from where it started, exchange variation, queen d3, the key move really, play queen to d7. Uh, after he takes, you can take with a king and then uh, try to play the end game like I did. Or you can even go for a simpler idea, take with a knight, uh, develop the pieces, castle, rook c8, and then go minority attack. I decided to go uh, for uh, king takes. If you're looking uh, to find a model game on how to take with a knight, I will uh, yeah, add something on the screen that uh, you can click on and it will take you to that video precisely. And uh, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Right, everybody getting uh, a game with the black pieces. Long time, uh, no Karo Khan. Okay, if you thought that I'm gonna be completely dumping this opening just because uh, I made some different videos. No, I won't dump you. I will never dump you, okay? Or at least not yet. So, we are having normal Karo Khan position and by the way, kind of like a higher rated opponent for our rating range. So we are doing the speed run. 1300 for the time being while my opponent almost 1600 that's kind of weird like um yeah he's on purpose playing lower rated players um uh, fine that's just a little observation let's focus on the game the rating of opponent is irrelevant as long as you play good moves so keep that one in mind i guess the advance you have two options bishop f5 or my favorite move i'm gonna stick with uh, c5 in my opinion, uh, you may have heard it a hundred times by now, but this is by far my favorite move to play. The easiest, just cutting a lot of theory, and uh, also has the advantage that uh, most of your opponents are really going to be completely clueless against this uh, until you reach like 2200, okay? So, um, yeah, keep that in the back of your mind. And our plan is very simple, okay? We're going to play knight c6 next, kind of no matter what. He goes dc5, okay? He plays kind of the better move. He has basically two main options in this structure. He can take or he can play without taking. In my opinion, without uh, taking is more common just because uh, they are afraid to, uh, let's say, play with a loose center. Because when you go for a move such as d takes on c5, you're never sure uh, if you can actually keep your pawn on c5 or not. So. Most people, in fact, uh, just play knight f3 or c3 here, where, uh, yeah, the main idea is to go knight c6, bishop g4, get a pin e6, and uh, we already uh, have showed that uh, on the channel many times. Perhaps you're also going to get a game with this in the video. No spoilers. I'm going to start with the knight, my favorite move. According to the theory, if you want to play it super precise, e6 is indeed the best move, as uh, showed by the engine, as showed by uh, top-level uh, grandmasters recently. 
e6 is best just basically because it's kind of winning the pawn by force and we are playing um, kind of a sophisticated version of the French defense. Okay, it's called the French defense because in the French defense normally it starts e6, d5 and then you have the locked bishop. Uh, so the difference is that, uh, well, in the French defense, white manages to sort of defend this pawn center while here we have kind of tricked him into taking, let's say, at the cost of a tempo. That is equal, not going to be doing that here. And he plays the most critical move as well, which is f4, where, honestly, if you don't remember the following move, you have big chance of getting in trouble. Not many people play f4 here, by the way. They mainly do knight f3 and then you get bishop g4, e6 and get to get an easy game after recapturing your pawn. But on f4, it's critical to play knight h6. Now, don't think of knight h6 as being uh, something that you play generally. It's here good because the pawn stops bishop from capturing it and knight h6 is also threatening to develop uh, the bishop actively. And then the knight can still be activated via f5. So he plays knight f3, I'm just gonna develop. On h3, uh, we always take on the advance and pretty much my next move is to go e6. We're getting a pretty interesting game. This is uh, a testing uh, variation and perhaps why uh, a lot of you may be afraid to try out this variation. Because according to the computer, this looks a little bit scary. Uh, but I quite like uh, Black's resources here. Now, in my opinion, I don't think this is the scariest move that he can play. I'm trying to recall my analysis. So queen a5, always uh, a move, but after knight c3, d4, he simply has uh, queen takes on d4, I believe. So... I'm not sure we're doing anything with that, and I would be much rather tempted to play e6. Just threatening this. Where I'm pretty much expecting him to play bishop e3. Now, after bishop e3, very tempting, it's knight f5. Okay, he just takes, that is definitely a mistake. I don't know why he really felt the need to release the pressure. I think he just plans to go b4 on the next move. However, he could have played b4 immediately if he really wanted to. I'm just going to take, uh, I can bet you he's going to play b4. Would be weird if he doesn't, okay, bishop e3. Uh, I don't understand why they make this uh, typical mistake of just taking uh, and releasing the tension early for no reason. And okay, it's important here. I feel like uh, at this point uh, a very common mistake is to go for the check, thinking that uh, they'll play c3 and then you have bishop takes on c5. Because white is having the b4 move. Good morning. White is winning a piece because of the fork. So instead, it's a critical idea to lure his bishop on f2 first. Where after queen a5 check, c3. Okay, I'm, I'm expecting this is to be... I mean, this should be the best move. Just because uh, after c3 we have bishop takes. And on b4, starting in our queen and bishop, same fork. You may be thinking, but bishop takes on f2 comes with a check. So that is really the key detail. Now, additionally, I just want to double check whether queen d2 is any scary. Perhaps it is. Is it? Kind of tough to say. Looks a little scary, honestly. <laughs> Another typical move for this variation is uh, g5. Kind of undermining... Uh, these pawns, uh, especially this knight f5 combo on bishop e3 followed by g5 is very strong. Yeah, I think that might be it because on queen a5, queen d2, I am failing to find really a good move. So it has to be g5. Whenever you feel like uh, you're running out of counterplay in this structure, you have to play g5. Okay, just generally, this is how you're going to be getting uh, your counterplay. Now, I'm kind of expecting him to take with a pawn where we have two ideas. We can kind of cash in the pawn back after takes and then queen g5. Or we can sort of play it in uh, Banco Gambit uh, fashion by playing uh, h6 there. Those are pretty much the two ideas. And on h3, I think, uh, yeah, the simple idea is to take. He's going to take with a queen and then I'm going to go gf. Just kind of weakening the pawn on e5. I could also play queen a5 check here. And perhaps this is better, because now queen c3, I don't think he's that strong. We can simply trade, and then uh, he's hanging the pawn. So I'm going to start with check. I think this is better, just to 
kind of win back uh, one pawn, at least. Because bishop takes on c5 is coming next, kind of no matter what. Like c3, bishop c5, I think that's the move. Not to play c3, gf, because of b4 intermediate move there. So we have to really take this one. b4, we take there, we check, so that should be okay. That should be just uh, fine, just in time with the compensation. Okay, he castles, I'm just going to take now. Not afraid of b4 for the same reason. He may be going uh, queen takes on f4. I may be looking forward to, uh, yeah, grab the g-file. Rook g8 kind of move. To be honest, g4 looks kind of scary. So just trying to make that uh, less appealing for my opponent. I'm going to do this move. Um, since I kind of feel like at this point uh, we have to go onto the other side because of the missing g pawn. It just makes it feel like castling long would be a little bit safer. So, uh, yeah, before not an issue, we take with check, key detail. There we have it. If he takes with the queen, I think we're happy to go endgame. Uh, he probably takes with the rook. No, he takes with the queen. So we have option to go endgame. We have option to attack the pawn. Which one is better? If we keep queens on, we can uh, still uh, try to go for like a long-term attack. I could also play for uh, endgame grind. Both uh, are pretty tempting, but... Because I'm uh, sort of low on time, I'm just going to go for an endgame. Usually with uh, less pieces on the board, uh, the moves are kind of easier. It's like uh, less pieces on the board, less things to blunder. So I think that's quite a useful uh, practical tip to keep in mind uh, whenever you're having uh, limited uh, time on the clock. I'm just going to go h4. Notice how one pawn is uh, stopping two pawns of my opponent. He has long-term weakness. I think it's just uh, a question of uh, whether my opponent uh, can be in time with knight f3, knight d4, exchanging my knight. And by uh, the looks of it, he's trying to do exactly that. Where are my opponents playing good moves? Okay, I'm just going to take. I'm going to go for the trade and I'm going to try to uh, use the hook. Notice that knight d4 is the threat, so I'm going to play a5. Now, this makes knight d4 lose a pawn, because I can take, and then b4 remains undefended. And if he takes, I'm just in time to play the move pawn to c5. Meaning that there's going to be knight d4 for you. I mean, there's going to be no knight d4 for you. Damn it, I completely spoiled what I was trying to say. Uh, anyways, let's just act like uh, that did not happen. Uh, okay, he goes a3, but now I think I can try, try to take. And then after pawn takes, notice that he has no more support for knight d4. So at least that's something. Should be something, right? Honestly, I'm completely clueless of uh, what I'm doing right now. But uh, I'm hoping knight g5 can be easily met by king e7. And now it's going to take him even more time to read out the knight. And I can always defend this pawn with rook a6 and preparing to double. Rook a6 and then this. This is like the target now. He gives me opportunity to take, and I think it's important to kind of uh, cash in this opportunity because we can perhaps try to put him in a mating net. Yeah, I, I don't have time to calculate it, but just intuition really tells me uh, we should be going for uh, for that. Now this is kind of like a monster threat for him. So I'm going to use my rook. I'm kind of going uh, all in right now. I'm going all in for check with knight g3 idea. That may very well just end the game. If not, well, we're in trouble. Okay, he's trying to hide. I'm uh, I'm going for it. That is still a mating net if he's not careful. And yeah, if he goes passive like knight f3, I can just go rook d1 and infiltrate. So he has to go check and take. Oh, he just plays b5. I can play this move. No, I can play knight g3. What? What is he doing? What am I missing? So check, I have king e8. He has no more checks, and this is unstoppable. And here you have it. Just remember this mating net. Okay, this. I can also just go king back. Ah, and then he wants uh, rook takes. And I think I have just blundered the perpetual. I think I just blundered the perpetual, didn't I? I should have played rook b1 and then uh, gone there. Hopefully it's a perpetual, but I don't see how he wants to win. 
Oh man, what a game. What a game. Decent play by my opponent overall, but I think if I had played the uh, Rook B1 there and then infiltrate, should have been enough uh, for a win. But he had very good opening, like he genuinely played one of the best things that you can against this line. So I'm gonna go uh, King C8 and uh, it feels like he's just gonna have to check me with the Rook uh, because this would, uh, I guess that works too. I'll have to play uh, king b7 and he has to keep checking me because whenever he goes for rook trade I have made so um, yeah kind of a pity we really uh, missed uh, what I believe it was quite a nice uh, little squeeze I have to say just because I didn't had uh, a lot of time on the clock uh, I went for the double edge continuation normally I wouldn't really give my opponent such a chance to bail out in the complications, but uh, I didn't really have uh, time to calculate things. So yeah, now he's just going to play back and forth. He cannot do anything to avoid this mating that is just too powerful. I was about to highlight this thing. Like if you can get your pieces like this against the enemy king, he's pretty much doomed. But uh, I just completely forgot about the fact that uh, he can infiltrate with both rooks. So. Here we are. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna have to play this. He can still check me with the rook, but uh, that's not gonna change. His knight is unable to participate, else I would have uh, really gotten mated. So, yeah. He's just kind of spending time now to figure uh, figure it out himself, but uh, yeah, ain't happening. He cannot, do, he cannot do much. He can start checking me here. That's just a force perpetual. But, uh, yeah, I may be already repeating myself like a broken record. We have to check this game because you may be thinking, Alex Van Zea, what is wrong with you? You cannot beat a 1600. Are you just completely washed already? Uh, obviously, but also, despite his rating, 1600, I think he played really solid chess. I'd give him at least like an 85 uh, accuracy by the way this game was played overall. Um, even though, yes, it was like a little bit strange in my opinion, like uh, I think he made uh, some inaccuracies uh, that I could easily tell, but uh, overall, I'll give him 85. We'll have to check it in the game review. Uh, I'm gonna give myself probably like an 88 and him, I'll give him 85. So let's check it. Okay, I mean, <laughs> you have just witnessed a perfect game by both sides. I think that's what it was. That's just really sassy. <laughs> He's 1500, but that is very sassy. I'm gonna be honest. I don't know what is uh, going on with this, pro uh, with this profile. If he was playing 85, I'm not suspicious, but 93. I feel like maybe I made some mistake myself at some point, but when both players are playing 93, that is just uh, not okay. Here you go. In case uh, you're feeling that uh, F4 is refuting uh, the line. It is definitely not. Uh, I have tremendous analysis uh, of these positions uh, inside my uh, chessball course on the Karukan, but as you can see, here we have it in practice. Uh, I guess you can even hold it against Stockfish. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Now, if you'd like to learn more about this opening, I highly advise you to check out the best video that I ever made. It is summing up my experience as a Karo Khan player for 80 years in only 20 minutes. It took more than 20 hours to record. So, I'll see you there.